A year passed and another hurried after it, and Patrick McGuire was still six months behind life. His mother six months ahead of it, his sister straddle-legged across it, one leg in hell and the other in heaven. And between the purgatory of middle-aged virginity, she prayed for release to heaven or hell. His mother's voice grew thinner like a rust-worn knife, but it cut venomously as it thinned. It cut him up the middle till he became more woman than man, and it cut through to his mind before the end. Another field whitened in the April air, and the harrows rattled over the seed. He gathered the loose stones off the ridges carefully and grumbled to his men to hurry. He looked like a man who could give advice to foolish young fellows. He was forty-seven, and there was depth in his jaw, and his voice was the voice of a great cattle dealer. A man with whom the fair green gods break even. I think I ploughed that lay the proper depth. She ought to give a crop if any land gives. Drive slower with that foul mare, Joe. Joe, a young man of imagined wives, smiles to himself and answers like a slave. You needn't fear or fret. I'm taking her easy as... As easy as... Easy there, Fanny. Easy, pet. They loaded the day-scoured implements on the cart as the shadows of poplars crookened the furrows. It was the evening, evening. Patrick was forgetting to be lonely as he used to be in April's long ago. It was the menopause, the misery pause. The schoolgirls passed his house laughing every morning, and sometimes they spoke to him familiarly. He had an idea. Schoolgirls of thirteen would see no political intrigue in an old man's friendship. Love. The heifer waiting to be nosed by the old bull. The notion passed, too. There was the danger of talk, and jails are narrower than the five-sod ridge, and colder than the black hills facing Armagh in February. He sinned over the warm ashes again, and his crime, the law's long arm, could not serve with time. His face set like an old judge's pose. Respectability and righteousness stand for no nonsense. The priest from the altar called Patrick McGuire's name to hold the collecting box in the chapel door during all Sundays of May. His neighbors envied him by his holy rise, but he walked down from the church with affected indifference and took the measure of heaven angle-wise. He still could laugh and sing, but not the wild laugh or the abandoned harmony now that called the world to new silliness from the top of a wooden gate when thirty-five could take the sparrow's bowl. Let us be kind, let us be kind and sympathetic. Maybe life is not for joking or for finding happiness in. This tiny light in oriental darkness, looking out chance windows of poetry or prayer. And the grief and defeat of men like these peasants is God's way, maybe. And we must not want too much to see. The twisted thread is stronger than the wind-swept fleece. And in the end, who shall rest in truth's high peace? Or whose is the world now, even now? Oh, let us kneel where the blind plowman kneels, and learn to live without despairing in mud-walled space, illiterate, unknown, and unknowing. Let us kneel where he kneels and feel what he feels. One day he saw a daisy and he thought it reminded him of his childhood. He stopped his car to look at it. Was there a fairy hiding behind it? He helped a poor woman whose cow had died on her. He dragged home a drunken man on a winter's night. and one rare moment he heard the young people playing in the railway style and he wished them happiness and whatever they most desired from life. He saw the sunlight and begrudged no man his share of what the misery soil and soul gives in a season to a plowman. 
and he cried for his own loss one late night on the pillow, and yet thanked God who had arranged these things. Was he then a saint? A Matt Talbot of Monaghan? His sister Marianne spat poison at the children who sometimes came to the door selling raffle tickets for holy funds. Get out, you little tramps, she would scream as she shook the hens an armful of crumbs. But Patrick often put his hand deep down in his trouser pocket and fingered out a penny or maybe a tobacco-stained caramel. You're soft, said the sister, with other people's money. It's not a bit funny. The cards are shuffled and the deck laid flat for cutting. Tom Malone cut for Trump. I think we'll make this game, the last, a tanner one. Hearts. Right. I see you breaking your two-year-old. Play quick, Maguire. The clock there says it's half past ten. Kate, throw another sod on the fire. One of the card players laughs and spits into the flame across the shoulder. Outside a noise like a rat among the hen roosts. The cock crows over the frosted townland of the night. Eleven o'clock and still the game goes on and the players seem to be drunk in an orient opium den. Midnight. One o'clock. Two. Somebody's leg has fallen asleep. What about home? Maguire, are you using your double tree this week? Why? Do you want it? Play the ace. There's it, and that's the last card for me. A wonderful night we had. Duffy's place is very convenient. Is that a ghost or a tree? And so they go home with dragging feet, and their voices rumble like laden carts, and they are happy as the dead or sleeping. I should have led that ace of hearts.